I was just a headache. Yeah. An out and out headache. So what years were you working with the Medellin and Cali cartels? Well, I was connected to them through 2008 to 2012. Um, and then 2012 is when I stopped working. Yeah. I stopped like, well, it wasn't 2012, 2015 I actually stopped totally. But, because it's only a network, I was plugged into the nephews, the cousins and the brothers who got sent as representatives to the main cartel people and they got sent to certain areas to represent their firm. And because I was a handy individual, handy with my hands, handy with weapons, I was sort of recruited and employed because I had no real allegiance to anybody. I was all about making money. Like even in even in London, England, I was one of the rare people, one of them rare people that, like North London and East London, through the nineties and the two thousands, have been in political ag with each other on the street, and there've been a lot of murders and a lot of ag over the years. Where I've always been that guy that could move in between North London, East London, West London, South London, and be accepted by everybody. So if you was having a, a war with Matey. And I'd come and go, I've got a problem with that geezer. I said, well, I can't do nothing, man. He's my pal, isn't it? Like, come on, man, we make money together. And because I always make money with people, I sort of, they, they sort of allow it. Like, and it's just a mutual respect. I don't know why people allow it. It's just a mutual respect, I suppose. Where I've been away with all the proper people. I've come into contact with lots of people from an early young age, and I've grown pretty extensively over the 30 year period I was involved in criminal activities. Um, I made a lot of harmonious relationships because I liked helping people. Um, and then I got paid to take care of people's problems. I got paid to look after people and I got paid to look after products. So although people think I'm this big guy, I was just an employee and I was like a freelance to the criminal underworld across the planet really. That was easier way to describe myself welcome to the world of marvin herbert if you've not seen his james english interview it's got almost four hundred thousand views in one month in the description box below this video is a link to marvin's channel he has just started his own podcast with my mate christian i'm going to urge people to go down click on the links watch marvin's interviews you will be absolutely gripped it doesn't get realer than what Marvin's been through. I just was grilled by him. He just interviewed me for two hours. <laughs> He's a real ball breaker. And to tell you the truth, I'm sick of just people asking me simple questions and not challenging my story. And it was good for me mentally to have to, you know, just give all the details and fill in all the blanks and add all of the additional information to Marvin when he interviewed me. And I'm sure you guys are going to find that fascinating that I was on Marvin's hot seat. Um, if you go down to Marvin and Christian's channels, what they're doing, you'll be able to watch that down there too as well. So please go over to great guys getting true crime content out. Please go down and click on those links and subscribe to those channels. So you've had a shitload of attempts on your life. Any stories you can tell us behind those? I can tell you about everything. <laughs> There's nothing I can't talk about. There's, yeah. There's nothing I can't talk about. There's been... Right. Just recently, well not recently, but between 2009, or 2000 and, yeah, 2009 to 2012, I received eight Osman warnings, right? From, I don't know how many other organizations, but because the police are not allowed to tell you where they're from or what areas they're from, you never really know, but because I was the kind of, I was the guy that got sent to collect the uncollectible. So I really spoke to people. I'll give you an, I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. Um, 
a friend of mine from London said to me, he's owed X amount of money from a little firm in Manchester. I won't mention no names because no names, I don't know yeah. what they're going to do. I don't know if they're active, but they'll know. And if, 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 if you know who I'm talking about, so reach out to me if we can like, expose this truth because it's just one of them things that, I'd, it's just, I just want everything to be real, isn't it? So basically this firm's, this firm's rung, um, my mate's rung, this, this person's had them over for, for, for you quid, would I go up and retrieve it? So I said, yeah, of course I will, I'll go and speak to them. So then I goes to Manchester, meets this little firm. I've turned up on my own as I always do. I don't need a gang of people because I'm pretty confident in myself. I know what I'm prepared to do and what I'm capable of doing. Not that I'm big headed, but I was very confident in my old life, right? So I've turned up in Manchester to see this firm. They've turned up maybe 10, 12 handed, three or four car loads. And then we're sitting down and we're talking. And then basically they just said, look, we don't like, like we know you're working. We know you're here working. We know it's graph, man, but we don't like the geezer you're working with. We really don't like him. Do you know what I mean? And to be fair, we know you're working, so we want to give you 75 grand, right? And then just walk away. So I said to them, look, I'll have a think about it. That's what I'll do, I'll have a think about it, right? So let's leave it at that today and we'll go about business. I'll let you know what I think and whatever. So I've left the meeting harmonious, gone back. So I've gone back to my pal, right? Because he's my mate, I've grown up with him. Um, he's a straight goer, but pretends to be a gangster. Right, so I've gone down to see him. I said, listen, you ain't getting paid, mate. I said, and it's got to go to gunplay, right? And I'm not prepared to go there. Do you know what I mean? I'm not prepared to go to gunplay for you. So I'd advise you to take the 75 grand, yeah, what they're offering me, right? So, no, I want all my money. I will really fucking mugs. I ain't having it with really. So I said, all right, sweet, fair enough. And I've walked away from him, yeah, and never replied to the 75 grand. They never paid me 75 grand but they never paid him either. Do you know what I mean? So the reason why I was telling you is just the integrity that I had in that world was insurmountable. Do you understand? Yeah. And you had to be that guy in that world. Otherwise you lost your credibility. And I wasn't scared to confront anybody that owed or anybody that was in the wrong. Because where I come from, you can't be wrong and strong. Do you understand? So although they're... They're, they're naughty members. They are naughty members. They've got history. They've done their bits. They've 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 stood up. They've turned around and they're moving forward. And I admire them for who they are, what they've been through. Like myself, people admire me for what I've been through and what I've achieved, sort of thing, you know. So you've got to give people props when props is due. So this little firm, a sensible little members, and I was sort of not. I was not overwhelmed. I was, I was honoured, yeah, that like, I'm in a foreign town, yeah, with some bad men, yeah, not getting told, what the fuck? Move for me, you fucking... Get out, you ain't getting paid, what, you mug? Because that's the sort of thing I would have done. But they showed me the maddest respect and just said, look, we know you're here working, mate, yeah? We'll give you 75 grand, just walk away and leave him. You can't stand him, he's an absolute cunt, blah, blah, blah. I said, all right, sweet, I'll think about it, you know? And I had to go back to me, mate. I said, look, take your 75 grand, otherwise you're not getting nothing. He was a dickhead, didn't want to take it, and now he got nothing, you know? So, and that happened all around the country. Me turning up on people's doors on my own and knocking on people's doors. A lot of, a lot of these gangsters actually phoned the police on me, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, I'm not even joking. A lot of them called police on me. There was a, there was a guy in... Um, Ah, oh, it is up the road from Manchester. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, what's the name? Uh, it will come to me in a minute. It will come to me in a minute. It begins with a B. As if you're going towards Leeds. Brigass, that's it, Brigass. One of the biggest car people in Brighouse. <laughs> I've turned up to put it on him for a, a, a debt for my old colleague. And uh, he phoned the police. <laughs> 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 and this, this is what my mate told me. I don't know how true it is, but this is what my mate told me after. Um, basically, the geezers rung the police and said, look, someone's come up here, da, 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 da. And then they've given my name and the old bill of, apparently, I don't know how true it is, but the old bill apparently said to this fella, if you owe the money, pay it because you're in trouble. Wow. And then the geezer actually rung my mate back and paid him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and he, he did. Uh, he paid him. And he rang me up and said, I've got a drink here for you. I've been paid. And then he told me the story after. Whether or not it was true, I don't know. But 
people were scared when I turned up, you know, wow. because I was, I was, I was, I was insane. And I'm not proud of the insanity. I'm just proud of how I got through the insanity, you know? So you've been in multiple life and death situations and hopefully we're going to get to those stories. But imagine people are wondering, how do you start out in that world? Oh, I started out in that world coming from a mixed race family in a multiracial household in a racist environment, um, not being accepted, being abandoned. My mum wasn't the greatest role model as a parent, neither was my dad. They was caught up with their own programme and their own mindsets. They was living their own lives, immature, sort of young adults trying to make their way in life. Um, they both made mistakes. And basically, we was left to grow on our own, really. You know, my mum done the best, she, and she really did do her best in the environments. You gotta understand, you, you're getting brought up in an environment where my mum would get spat on walking down the street. Holy shit. But she'd fight. Or someone would say you you this or the like not it weren't like every day people would spit at me mum but you know you'd see people like you dirty and <sighs> I've been in situations where my mum's actually I've seen my mum fight big men like over situations with my sisters my brothers and my mum was a, a brawler she knocked my dad out who was a six foot member you know like my mum was a tough cookie who was making the best choices that she could in her environment and her stages of her life you know so. Um, we grew, I grew up pretty quick, you know. I, I was I was sort of not addicted to drugs as a junkie sense, but I smoked drugs from a very early age. I was smoking crack and heroin for the first year of secondary school. Mm. Um, I was selling puff, crack, and no, not crack. I was selling puff and cocaine and ecstasies at the age of 13, 14, and fifteen. You know, um, we was nicking car stereos burgling asses but and as crazy as it sounds we was a criminal empire of juveniles mm. because it was crazy growing up but coming from the background we had my dad was a, a major drug importer doing a lot of drugs with the um, Liverpool connection um, I want to speak to a couple of the old villains that my dad grew up with to see if I can start mentioning their names but um, one of them done 22 years, his brother done a lump of bird. They were really close to my dad in the early 70s and then they all got a lump of bird. And my dad went on his journey while the others got into class A's. My dad carried on doing the sentimenia, moved to London with his family. And then basically my dad was a playboy character, sort of uh, playboy gangster kind of bad man but not a gunman. He wasn't a gunman, he was just a fighting man. Um, so basically I was brought up being tough, getting beaten, you know, so in the house, the beatings weren't sort of sporadic. The beatings was constant, you know? So everything we went through as a kid sort of molded the characters that we became, you know? Um, The, it, it was very traumatic. When I look back retrospectively now, it was traumatic. I've learned to deal with a lot of the trauma. Um, as we speak, and I, like, if, if I started talking about my dad for specifically, like, I will become emotional. I try not to talk about him specifically because I don't want to look like the crying, whinging person who's looking for a reaction from every podcast I go on with a tear. So sometimes I sort of clam up and the emotion don't come out but it's life is a, a mixing bowl of emotional content that we've got to sort of navigate ourselves through make sense of survive and grow at the same time and when you're getting beaten battered and neglected rejected and abused it's kind of hard to find any form of normality mm. so that's what started me off on that journey just the constant urge to be normal you know it was just i wanted to be like everybody else i wanted to have what everybody else has got 
Mm. I wanted to be accepted. Like people don't understand. I'll say people don't understand. White people won't understand and black people won't understand the plight of the mixed race people. Do you understand? Like people don't get it. Like even that frown on your face then is just like, what are you on about? Right? Because I weren't allowed in black people's houses or white people's houses because I was the scourge from both races. Mm. Like, how could you be with him? He's with a white woman. How could you be with him? He's with a white black bird. Like, it's just the total opposite. So I was always looked upon as something dirty. So I never felt worthy of anything growing up as a kid. So for me to be worthy, I found my solace in violence. And that's what Marvin Herbert become. A uh, Tasmanian devil ball of chaotic aggression and violence. Where did the fearlessness come from? See, the fearlessness come from my dad, that, like, that's what I mean. It's just even when I talk about it, it's like not, not wanting to cry. Do you know what I mean? I'm not allowing him to hurt me. It ain't gonna fucking happen. You ain't gonna hurt me. And just that there is where the fearlessness come from. Is I would never allow him to make me cry. He couldn't make me, like, yeah, just, I just, I wouldn't, so that's why it all comes out now, because I held it back so much when I was a kid, because I wouldn't allow him to see me cry. But now when I talk about it, it, it fucking hurts. It really hurts. And that's dealing with the trauma, right? So what made me fearless was the fact that I could take anything my dad gave me. And what my dad gave me, my dad was bigger than most men. So when I looked at men, you didn't scare me because you ain't giving me what my dad gave me, you know? And that's giving me my confidence, my fearlessness and my drive to outdo my dad. And that happened at age 14. I grew to the level and I told him over a scenario with my mum, basically, my dad used to leave his drugs in my mum's house. Like my dad's, my mum's house was my dad's slaughter. And basically I used to find all my dad's drugs. So I used to nick his drugs and sell them with my mates. But then my dad always used to accuse my mum. But because obviously as a kid, everyone likes to blame someone for what they go through. So I blame my mum for a lot of shit. So my mum getting a beating off my dad, I used to think, ha, huh, bitch, good. Cause I ain't got this, I ain't got that, I ain't got this and that's cause of you. So I used to do things knowing my mum would get a beating. And then after about 13, 14 years of age, it was a thing, I was in my room with my mates and I heard my mum getting bad. And I was sitting with my mates, but it's like five of us in the room and my mum's getting battered because we're all selling the drugs she's getting battered for. Mm. So because I had that moral very young, you can't be wrong and strong, I've just sort of said to my mates, listen, we can't do, we got to do it, man. We, we got his gear, what the fuck? And they're like, Marv, it's your dad, isn't it? I was like, no, come on, man. We got to do him. And I had a bayonet, a couple of other tools in the room. So I just said, come, we got to do him, man, come on. So I picked up the bayonet, which is the blade that goes on the end of a rifle for the people that don't know. It's about, I've done about 17 inches long, 18 inches long. So I've run down the kitchen with that, booted the front door, the kitchen door open and just stuck the blade right on my dad's throat and said, touch her again, I'll kill you, you fucking mug. Now, I actually did believe that my pals were right behind me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I believed it, right? And then, like, he sort of, he backed up a little bit and I, I pressed him. I never I never poked it into his skin where it bled, but it poked it in where he was worried and he, he backed up. So he knew that it would go through him if he tried to confront me. So he backed up. Because I know he didn't want to kill me. He was, a, he was a bad man. He could have took it off me. He could have done what he'd done. But in my head, I was backing up the biggest thing in my life. I was the biggest threat in my life. So I was winning that. So every, t every step he took backwards made me grow. Do you know what I mean? It made me grow. I was thinking, wow, this is amazing. He shit himself. I've backed my dad up. I've backed my dad up. So basically, when he's backed up, I've, I've gone in the kitchen, backed him up. 
he's backed up. So I thought he shit himself. Obviously, I'm full of confidence. I'm full of my own self-esteem. I'm ego. I thought he's backing up. He's shit himself. Oh, I'm the man. I'm the man. I'm the man. And then I backed him. I said, "Get out, my ass! Don't ever come back. This is my ass now. Now I'm now I'm growing now. Now I'm, yeah, I'm the man. He's gone, and he went about his business. And then basically, I sort of detached myself from my dad at that stage, you know. Um, yeah, and then other little things happened. I pulled a gun out on him in front of his friends over Stonebridge. You know, like I've done, I've done a lot of things, sort of to massage my ego where my dad was concerned. You know, but what were the circumstances you pulled a gun on him? Well, it was more me showing off. If I'm being honest, it was. I never, I didn't need to pull it out on him. But what I've done is. He, he used to have like a gambling, he used to go to gambling houses where they do gambling, play dominoes, and they used to sell a lot of weed, like Shabins and all these places. So there'd be certain places where you could go and buy drawers. Right? So all them places in around North London, West London, you go and buy a bit of weed. My dad was the guy that supplied the weed to the people that done the weed houses. Um, not all of them, but a few of them. So these places used to go, he was regarded and respected in these places. So I thought, if I went and put it on my dad in these places, then it's gonna put me up the ladder, innit? So I've gone over there with one of my pals and just sort of said to him, don't bother coming to my ass no more, man. Don't come over my ass no more. I'm the, I'm a man now. And if you come to my head, I'm gonna blow your head off. So don't bother coming to my ass. And then his pals have said something, I've turned the gun on them. And I was like, what the fuck, man? Shut your mouth and they've all, like, But that was something I'd done, something I'm not proud of. I've done it to show off in that world. Although the gun was a replica, it wasn't even a real gun. I was doing it out of ego to say I'm the man, but it worked. And it filled me with a full sense of security growing up. And not a full sense of security, it filled me with a sense of security and a sense of empowerment, you know, to move through that world and not be scared of no one. And that's, they're the two things that made me pretty fearless against people. And then my first beating in Feltham was another one. Um, I knocked a, I busted a, an SO's eye open and had a fight with a few screws after they pressed the bell. But I was having that much of a fight, they split both my eyes open, busted my nose. And I was actually half doing the screws because the, where I was located, it was hard for them all to rush me because I was in between two buffs on Partridge. So anyone that knows Feltham, Right? I'm on Partridge and they used to have two baths and then the baths, when the door opened, the two baths were there. So the door would open and it opened and it closed on the, like, that's the two baths. So when the door opens, it opens like that, opens on the baths. So when the screws are trying to come into the shower room, they couldn't get to me because I was where the baths were. Mm. And for them to come in there to open the door, which closed me off into a little strip. So there was only two or three officers could get in the, in the, in the space where the baths were. So they, normally there's 30 officers that jump on you, right, and they bend you up. But because they couldn't all jump on me, I had the space to fight two or three at a time. So it went on for about five, 10 minutes and they were getting cut, eyes busted. I was getting cut, eyes busted, but they couldn't grab me. And that's their cue, that's their cue. They grab you and bend you up, yeah. right, the CNR. So because they couldn't grab me and I could keep punching. It went on for a lot longer than it normally would have. Eventually, they've got me down. So when they've got me down now, there's something called the M1, it was called. It was like the, it was like the, the, the walkway from the block to the wing, right? So it was like half a mile or a quarter of a mile long. So they've got me bent up, all your arms are bent up, all me up and back. And I had 30 officers, obviously, because there's, there's, I think it's four officers or three officers from each wing and there's 10 wings. So. When the right bell comes, three officers from every wing come at the same time. So about 20, 30 officers. So they all kicking your head in. So I'm getting my head kicked in and punched. I'm getting kicked out the bollocks. I'm getting stamped on, I'm getting punched. I'm getting beaten. But in my eyes, in my eyes, I'm only 16, 17. In my eyes, by big grown men. Yeah. But they're not hurting me. It's not hurting. What they're doing is they isn't actually hurting me. Cause I'm full of adrenaline, I'm screaming, I'm fuck fighting, trying to fight, and they're bending me up, bending my arms back. Gets down the block, and basically what they do, they fold you up, put you on the floor, and then they exit one at a time, and then they all run out of the cell, 
and then you they let you go and you just all unfold it's like oh mm. but i've jumped up i'm like come on then bang 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 on the door come on and i'm thinking to myself why have you run off why have you run off why have you? and then <laughs> the next morning they've opened the door and it's kicked off again and then they brought my dinner it's kicked off again every time they open my door it just kicked off with the screws so after a while they've come and said oh but come on please there's no need we want to put you up on the wing like calm down we ain't got a problem with you and then basically they said look if you behave yourself for two days we'll put you up on i think it was the best wing in the jail nightingale so we'll put you on this on this wing if you calm down so i said all right sweet so then i calmed down and they put me back on the wing and then i was on the wing for three months and then i starved me up and sent me to brixton then and start up means you get taken from a juvenile to an adult prison when you're not legally allowed to be taken there. Do you know what I mean? So I think I was 17 when I got taken to the um, in Brixton. I wasn't allowed in YPs after that. What was that like arriving at the adult facility? Um, it was just arriving at the adult facility, mate. And I was, I was one of them people that... You knew a lot of people in there already. Well, not so much the men, but I was game. So in my head, I was just, I'm, I'm, having, I'm fighting, isn't it? So who's the biggest, baddest, hardest person in there? I've got to stick it on them. I've got to have it. I've got to, like, I've got, I was one of them really loud people, lemon, confrontational. So if I turn up, we're having an argument, we're having a fight, and, or I'm running things. And it was just that simple. I wasn't trying to be anything but the hardest villain in the environment. Yeah. And that's all I ever tried to be, you know? the biggest, baddest person in that environment. And I'll try to live up to being that person. So fighting adults then, how was that? A lot easier than fighting kids. Was it? Yeah, because a lot of the adults, believe it or not, was all washed up, junkies, mm. weak, like no real arsehole, scared of getting put down the block, scared of losing remission. They've got families, they want to go home. Yeah. I'm a kid, I didn't give a fuck. Do you know what I mean? So. Me, like, it, it wasn't an issue fighting, getting Nick going down the block. I, sp I spent two thirds of every prison sentence down the block. Do you know what I mean? I weren't, I was a wing, I was on wings, but always taken off the wings for GOAD, good order and discipline, for either um, bullying, um, violence, or controlling the drug culture. You know, so I always got moved off GOAD, ghosted to other prisons because of running a drug culture or sort of in cahoots with members of staff bringing drugs in. You know, there was lots of allegations, there's lots of officers got arrested throughout my incarceration, teachers, um, officers, solicitors, like everybody in every field has been arrested in connection with bringing drugs into prison apparently for Marvin Herbert, but Marvin Herbert's never been arrested. So we done everything, we tried everything, um, we sort of experienced everything that you could do to get by in prison, survive in prison, and just sort of ride your prison sentence, you know? So, there weren't nothing we never done in there. Going back to your teen years then, what life and death situations were the craziest in your teen years? <laughs> they're, all, they're, they're all as crazy as ever. the next one. There's no real defining one they've all been any stories you can tell us from well, the teen years yeah well, I can tell you a story about every scar on my body like what stories you want to know about all of them um, well alright oh, see it's, it's, it's hard to put it into content of what one so the one I will talk about okay. the one I will talk about was uh, I had a fight with I don't know if there was five or six of them, but the three of them was renowned to be the hardest men on the rave circuit, doorman category-wise, right? What year was this? Um, 89, 90. Summer of Love. Yeah. 89, 90. It might have been 91. It was Ministry of Sand, right? So I'm at the Ministry of Sand. Um, like I said earlier, um, I've been... It was, it was alleged that I was there to rob the manager of 80 grand. That was the story that got put out after I got chopped up. Because after I got chopped up, um, my older lot that I used to do the armed robberies and that with, and worked tongue in cheek with the, the security, 
because they was armed robbers that invested in drugs. Drugs got sold in the clubs. The doorman took a cut because they had blind eyes and all the sort of bollocks, right? So the doorman served me. Well, we had a, apparently, the words of another DJ, I'll have to, yeah, I don't know if I can mention his name or when we'll be connected to it, but another DJ, another MC, <laughs> he was an MC at the time, but he said it was the best fight he's ever <sighs> seen. And basically what's happened, I'm in the dance floor, someone's called me out, said security wanna have a word with me. No, I'll tell you the story from the beginning. So please, please. I go, I'm buzzing out my nut. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm robbing security vans. I'm doing all sorts of madness to generate financial revenue streams. So I'm pretty flush with cash. I've never, in them days, it was no less than five, 10 grand at partying. So we're out with a load of reddies, loads of birds, loads of fun, having a giggle. Um, I've got um, a boulevard. I don't know if you've heard of a, a, a watch called Boulevard. Mm -hmm. but so it was the first, one of the first ever gold watch manufacturers from America, right? And it was a little tank watch with a, with a crocodile skin strap. And it was like my, it was my tool. Do you know what I mean? It was like, it, was my, it wasn't a Rolex. Like, to me, it was better than a Rolex. But like all these watches, everyone, the, the, the tanks, they used to wear the, 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 the Cartier Santoses and things like that. The Rolex Submariners back in them days. But to me, this was a gold tank watch. <laughs> to me so leather <laughs> so I was like a proper chap with me gold watch right so I, I love this watch so I'm in the toilet having a pierce a couple of geezers come up to me ask me for the time but I can't see because you used to take ease right so yeah you know and your eyes are going yeah yeah and you just can't see and my eyes are over <laughs> <laughs> trying to piss trying to piss eyes are going over the place uh. geezers gone we've got the time mate so I don't get scared. I don't get scared of getting robbed. I don't I don't get intimidated by things. So when he said, have you got the time? I've gone like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's pulled my arm back and I'm uh -oh. like, what are you doing, mate? And I'm trying to pull my arm. I thought, what's he doing? I thought, this cheeky cunt. So, because I can't get my arm back, my instant reaction was just to undo my blade. So I've undone my blade because there was all lock knives back then. So I've done done my blade. Turned around and just started stabbing him up. I said, what the fuck are you doing, mate? What the fuck are you doing? And then his mates come over, so I plunged his mate up as well. And then I've just sort of, I've just cleaned the knife, come out, walked out of the toilet. So I've gone up to one of the bands, because you bear in mind, when I used to walk up to the gate of the door of the ministry, I could run allowed to sell alcohol in the ministry at this time, right? So I used to walk up to the gate with two or three cases, not I will not carrying, but people I was with carrying cases of champagne. But we'd get let in by the security and we'd get left alone to do whatever we wanted in the nightclub by the security, right? So when I've come out of the toilet, I've gone to the security and said, mate, do me a favour, let matey know that there's two kids in there. I'll just serve them up, mate. They'll try to fucking rob me, the cheeky little cunts. And I've gone on back onto the dance floor. What I didn't know was the two kids that I'd stabbed was plugged in to the security. Um. One of the security's pals, brothers or something like that. So then they've gone back out and said, fuck, Marvin served up such and such, such and such. So then they've reacted, get him out of here, get him out of here. As I've walked out, I've opened the door like that and I've been chopped in the head with an axe. Right? So that chop there, I've got Jesus chopped with an axe. Christ. Right? So I'll get chopped with the axe. and Because uh, I'm out of my nut. I'm out of my nut. I've looked, I've, I've looked at his hand and I see an axe in his hand. I was like, you just hit me with that. Because I didn't know what had happened. Right? And he's gone... Bang, he's done me with it again. And I was like, fuck. And boom. So we, so we start fighting, starts fighting. Next thing, other people start fighting. So now, them days, I was a very sort of cantankerous individual. I was very aggressive. So I went out prepared for rag. So I had a, a can of gas on me. We used to have CS gel. It weren't even spray back then because the, the, the spray used to do you. So then we started going to France and buying the gel. No, I'm telling the lie. We got the gel from the counter surveillance guy in Bayswater. There was a, a counter surveillance spy shop and the, and the guy used to sell us this spray, the, the gel. So I've got the gel, I've got my spring loaded kosh, I've got a two shot der derringer and a blade, <laughs> right? So that was just look with the, the party pack going out. Cause you don't, anyway, so I've got to, uh, having a fight. Now I'll try to get the gun out. 
boom, I've been it with the thing, the gun's gone, I've tried to get the blade out, the blade's gone, I've got to get the gas out, I'm, I'm, I'm getting done, right? So I'm trying to get these weapons out, can't get them out, but I'm still fighting, still fighting, still fighting. But luckily enough for me, yeah, I've always been a fit guy, right? Even to that, I'm fit, like, uh, everyone knows me, knows that I'm fit and I can have a rat and I'm in the gym. I'm, I'm disabled, one eye, one leg, and I'm still in the gym sparring professional boxers today. Right, so back then I was extremely fit. I was twice as wild as I am today. So fight, 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 fight. All the other bouncers, they're all smoking, sniffing, puffing, partying. They're fucked. They can't breathe. They're blowing out their asses, right? So I'm, I'm they, they're telling me, stand there, stay there. I'm pissing with blood. I'm like, what would you mean? Stand there, fuck that. So it's just off and off and off and off. Oh, got, to the, got to the stage where they've, they've bear hugged me. One's bear hugged me, the others will grab my feet and then they've run me through the dance floor, out the back door and threw me out the back door and slammed the back door. So now, that's done, I'm covered in blood. I don't want to boot the door. I boot the door a little bit, but where we're back, backed up onto the elephant and castle, I didn't want to get anyone nicked. So I thought, if I carry on doing this, I'm going to get people nicked, fuck it, let's go. And then the geezer's pulled up in a CLK Merc. And he's gone, mate, mate, do you want, what's happening? I said, fuck. I said, can you give me a lift, mate? He went, yeah. I said, where? I said, Clarkwell, because I lived in Clarkwell at the time. So I've got him to drive me home. I've gone home. I had a 410, which is a, um, a single shot um, shotgun. No, a double shot 410 it was, up and over. So I had a double shot up and over and I had a 32 revolver. So I've gone home, cleaned up, rolled a joint, woke the missus up. She's gone nuts. And then I've come out to get back in the car and go back down the ministry to blast these cunts up. <laughs> and the driver's gone the driver's gone so now I've got to go hospital so I go to hospital go to hospital get stitched up um, come out of the hospital I've rung my pal and I'll, t I'll talk because Lenny's fell off now but Lenny Sanderford he was I've rung Lenny I said Lenny mate your pal's chopped me up last night you know it's a fucking Libby I'm coming I'm coming yeah I've got my things I'm coming can you line them up let's have a meet we've got to sort this out so he said yeah yeah sweet what? Like, boom. so he's rung me back about a couple of hours later he said you need to come Woodford so I said, all right, sweet, I'll be over. So I got the 410, I got, um, did I have the 410 or a pump? I can't remember if it was, a, if, no, it was the 410, it wasn't a pump, it was the 410 and the revolver. Right, so I've got the 410 and the 32 revolver. So I've got in the car and I drove over there. He's over there now with a guy called Neville. So as I've walked into the house, I'm thinking, now, nah, these are his mates that have served me up because he introduced me to these people. So I'm thinking, right, it's on with you lot now. So I've gone and said, what the fuck, mate? He said, what the fuck? Why are you trying to rob John? I was like, what? What are you talking about, John? What John? So he's looked at Neville and said, I told you you didn't know him, man. I said, what do you mean? John who? John who? He said, the manager of the ministry. I said, no, 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 fucking manager of the ministry. I said, I've gone to the toilet. He's just trying to rob me. I served him up. I come out. I told matey they're in the toilet. And then fucking matey's called me out. I've come out and I've been chopped, mate. It's a fucking Libby. So he's like, oh, right, we'll have to sort it out with these lot. So he got on the phone, sort it out. I said, no, I want to fucking see him now. I want to meet you now. I want to meet you now. I don't give a fuck. I'll meet you now, mate. Anyway, cutting a very long story short, they didn't meet me. I went wild for a little while. Um, I went and got a pump action. Um, well, I never got the pump action. My friend Junior McDonough, rest his soul, he got the pump action. So then we just went out on a rampage for a couple of days, just looking to return whatever happened to me. Um, all the people involved in me getting served up sort of hit the long grass and sort of disappeared for a little while. Um, I caught one of them, the person that called me out, I've caught him in, in dungeons over Lee Bridge Road. So I've caught him in there and as I went to shoot him, a couple of my mates have jumped in front of him. I said, what are you doing? I said, what are you talking about? He fucking called me out, he's got to go. And then a couple of my mates have come up behind me and bear hugged me. And they've took the gun off me and they're like, I'm going, what the fuck, man? And they're like, Marv, he's with us, man. What are you doing? Like, you can't kill one of us, you cunt. What's the matter with you? I said, what? And then he was trying to explain what had happened. Basically, now I know he had nothing to do with it. They've just said to him, do me a favour, go and get Marv. And he's just come in and got me. Like, he didn't know what was going to happen, do you know what I mean? But at that time, I believed he did. So I tried to shoot him and, and then, and then for the grace of God, really, I got arrested. I got arrested for armed robbery. Yeah, because I was thinking, did I get arrested? No, I got, I, was, I got arrested for the shooting first and it was when I got out of the shooting, I got acquitted at the Bailey for a shooting of another bouncer down Camden Town. And when I got off of that, 
that's when I got chopped up. And when I got chopped up, I went to return it. And whilst I was in the midst of looking for the people that done me, I got nicked for an armed robbery and went away. Mm. And then that was the end of that till 15 years later that re-emerged, so, but in a harmonious way. So people watching this, you must be absolutely gripped by Marvin's story. I'm gonna put this out as a separate clip. So like I said, at the very beginning, please go down in the description box and check out Marvin's podcast. The link is down there. All hard hitting stories at the level of what you're hearing now. This is just absolutely mind blowing. This is just some of the most just action packed stuff we've ever had on the channel. And Marvin certainly knows how to tell a story. What I would, what, what, what I would like to let your viewers know, right? I'm not actually here trying to glorify what I've done, right? What I'm trying to establish is the crazy mindset that I had for the insanity, barbaric behavior that I displayed and that it was not worth it. And if you're venturing down that road and think that you're gonna become someone, then I have no doubt that you will achieve your goal. But what I can guarantee you is it won't be worth it when you reach your goal. Right, because I got to the top of the ladder and I'm not saying it to be egotistical, I got to the top of the ladder and that's why I'm here today because I got to the top of the ladder and realised that I've got to jeopardise my freedom and my life forever. And then my children, my kids, my kids' kids, they're in bother, they're in trouble as well. Because when I go to prison, they suffer. If someone wants to reenact problems to me and they want to light my house up or shoot my car up or look after, look to get me and they can't get to me, they're going to go for my kids, you know? Someone attacked my youngest son over a stupid bit of shit, but my eldest son, I mean. You know, so they come, they, they come unstuck rushing my son because they never done my son, do you know what I mean? But the point of the situation is they attacked my son and if I continued in that life, then it would have happened eventually to somebody. It would have been one of my nephews, one of my cousins, one of my sons, my missus, my kid, any of my daughters, anything could have happened, do you know what I'm saying? Just yeah. like, that life, I led that life to get out of the piss hole, you know? I wanted out of that piss hole. I wanted out of that environment. So I'd done whatever it took to get out of that environment. And although it wasn't the correct avenue to take, it was the only avenue I felt I had. And right now, 21st century, I don't wanna hear that people tell me that that's the only avenue they got, because it isn't. And right now, there's a million and one avenues where you can make dough easy. It ain't like the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Like now, nah, all you need is an idea, a brain, a business plan, and a good network. And you got dough, do you understand? I'm making dough. And I'll even say, Sean Atwood, you come out of fucking prison, skin, they confiscated every penny off you. And now, ex-offender, prison, fucking ecstasy importation, big gang, ping gang, fucking Sammy the Bull, all these fucking gangsters. And now you're legit making money. And then we could have done this 20 years ago. If he'd have stayed in his fucking stockbroking business, he'd be a multi-billionaire, if not a billionaire. But no, the ego, the materialism, and the money excites us. And the little men... Our little men, yeah? So don't let your little man control your decision-making process growing up. And yeah. that's to the youngsters out there. So yeah. many important lessons in the in your 20s, no common sense, the women coming up to you all night long, you're the man throwing the parties, that's that's a big part of it. And just don't get gangsteritis, young people. I go into prisons now, Marvin goes into prisons, and I tell the fellas, if you're running a drug business, you've got the skill set to re not just the skill set to re run a legitimate business because you've got to have the eyes in the back of your head and you're looking out for the cops and everything else. You've got a superior skill set to the other people who are running legitimate businesses and you can succeed and you just got to apply that and it's hard work. It took me a long time to make it in, in selling books and you just got to have perseverance. People get jealous, trip you up, keep going, keep going, keep going. Never give up. Yeah. Never give up, mate. And you think about it, that you made it to be Arizona's sort of drug E sort of kingpin, so they say in the papers, right? And you're from a basically middle class background. Yeah. From a privileged environment. Yeah. Right. So if people like you can become them people, it shows you how fucking simple that world is. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But show me a man, show me his house. Show me a man, show me his kids. Do you understand? And there ain't a villain 
that I know. Well, there is a villain. There's only one small, I'd say 2% of the villains that I know sort of look after their family in the correct way. The rest of them, they don't. And they don't, yeah? They all pretend that they're making bundles of dough and they all pretend that they've got everything. But all their women are moaning. All their kids are suffering, okay? And that's a fact. 98% of people are suffering in that world, right? Their kids are suffering. And that's why their kids grow up to think, I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm going to be better than my dad. But they don't realise being a criminal is not going to make you a better person. It will not make you a better person, mate. Yeah, come away from crime and look inside yourself to the one unique skill set that you have and develop that into a business project or into a business infrastructure, into a sort of product. And if you've got a brain to do things, then that will create business. If you've got a, an ability to do things, then that will create business. If you've got an idea to do things, that will create a business. So just connect with the right networks and use yourself or utilise yourself as a human being because every single one of us has a unique skill to pass on to perpetuate the species. And that is a fact. And the other important lesson there is think about your family. When I was running around on all those drugs, 5,000 miles away my parents were, and I'm thinking they're never going to find out. Then there was all the media after I got arrested, and my mum read a story that was all sensationalised, and she had a nervous breakdown. She was a college teacher. She went into the college... And she started screaming at people, I know you've read the story, I know you know what's going on. And they didn't have a clue what she was on about. Dad had to get her from the college and she's been on off medication to this day. And then the, the fact that they supported me and flew 5,000 miles to visit me every year while I was incarcerated. My mum would wait for hours in the desert, sniffer dogs on her and everything. And um, I'd come out my cell and my mum would be sat there in this little room and just to see the stress on her face and, a, and and just the looks, just the hurt on her face that I put her through and all the suffering. All for a and drug, a drink and a bird. Yeah, exactly. It just makes me feel sick, just just thinking about it. And that's why that's yeah. why, that's why, why I do what I do now, because what I've learned is I only ever dealt with my trauma by creating more trauma. So I never dealt with anything. I just created more chaoticness. And I've done it throughout my family, I've done it throughout my friends, and I've done it throughout my, my life, you know? And it's part of a programming that is hard to let go of, but you have to. Like, I had a troll yesterday telling me I should get shot in the head because I'm having it with old Bill. And I just sort of said to him, look, mate, you obviously haven't lived that serious of a life because I've actually experienced, I've seen enough, I've experienced enough, I've been through enough, I've been, a, I've, and I've had enough. You know, so maybe when you've gone through life on a different frequency, you'll have enough of what I've had enough of. So until that time, small pony, grow up, <laughs> you know. So you mentioned that you went away for 15 years then. On and off. Like, oh, on and off. It, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't one stretch. It was um, a five-year sentence, a five-and-a-half-year sentence, an 18-month sentence, a year sentence, and then four years on remand. But when I do bird, I do my bird. I don't get... D cats, I don't get C cats, I don't get home leaves, tan visits. I'm very subversive in jail. I ride my bird, I make money. Um, I always used to think I was the most sensible person in jail, you know, and now I understand why people used to laugh at me or think I was an idiot. Like the most sensible people think, you're off your head, mate, you're fucking stupid. And I think, what are you on about, you idiot? My, my missus is going on holiday, the kids have got food, and they're like, but you're not going home. What the fuck's the fucking point, mate? You earn twice as much outside. But because I was brought up in an environment where I never had much, my mindset was always, as long as my kids have got all the materialistic stuff that I never had, I'm a good dad. And that's another thing about being materialistic, man. It's not a good thing. You know, be conscious, be righteous, and be selfless, and you'll be good. I thought the meaning of life was money. And then when I lost everything, I was pining for it the first year, but after two, third, I think it was in the beginning of the third year, everything, I lost everything, lost my girlfriend. And I, all of that gone, I had this weird sense of liberation. And then just reading like philosophy and stuff, I learned that happiness is in here. It's in your heart and it's in what your thoughts make it. Because all that money I had, I'm not knocking money, you can have a good life if you use it sensibly, but all that money had just brought me a shitload of trouble, basically. Yeah, that's all it does. It's the wrong money, isn't it? It's not money in per se. It's 
money that comes from the wrong frequency. Yes, you know? exactly. So if it's if it's, if it's bad frequency, bad energy, money, then it's just traumatic, and you can't get good energy from crime. That's why every criminal, right? Every criminal has ag, has dramas, has prison, has headaches, has shootings, stabbings, killings, and prison. Like that's why they have it because it's not a good frequency. Now straight goers. Like I've got friends, millionaires, that have never even been punched in the face. Imagine that. I can say he's been punched up the ribs now, though. <laughs> and I put that one out there because I had to... Uh, one of my friends is so middle class that they're so used to being powerful in their environment because he's, he's been so wealthy over his years. He's been control people with his wealth. So one day he got out of school to me, but I did tell, tell him a couple of weeks prior, I said, if you talk to me like that again, I'm going to give you a shot up the ribs, yeah? So I'm going to give you a 10% shot up the ribs next time you talk to me like that. Anyway, well, something's happened one day and he talks out of school, so I'll give him a 10% shot up the ribs. And it put him out of the game for three weeks. And he was like, oh. So after, after it happened, he was like, get out of my house. And I was like, ha, ha, ha. I said, I ain't going nowhere. I'm here for a reason and we're going to finish what we started, son. I said, but I told you, don't speak to me like that again, son. But then he's learned a lot from me being around him. Do you know what I mean? Because I've learned a lot being around him about me. Do you understand? But yeah. Yeah, he's never even been hit. Never had a fight. Well, yeah, now he's been hit. But it just shows you the contrast between making money healthy and making money illegitimately and the health is just there's, there's no comparison you just can't do it it's it's just not worth it like you might go and nick a hundred grand today right but the hundred grand you nick was going to bring a hundred grand worth of problems you know and i've never i've never done anything where i've had plain sailing and without any headache there's always been headache. Like you always, your doors always get booted off. You always getting nicked. People trying to rob you. People trying to do set you up. Like it's, it's just. I mean, like when I was robbing money before, I was helping people out, and then one kid decided to. He owed a hundred and something grand out to someone. So he said to me, "Marv, could you do me a favour? Could you get me any work?" So what I used to do when I used to rob large amounts of money, rather than keeping large amounts of money at home. We weren't allowed bank accounts because certain criminals, you just, you're not allowed a bank account. So I could never open a bank account. So for me to bank my money, I used to buy drugs and then give it to people. So they'd sell it to make money for themselves, but my money's in the bank. And the double-edged sword of that was, I had drugs all the time. <laughs> so it was my money, it was my way to keep my money and have drugs for free. So if I, if I buy you a key of coke, you can't charge me for an eighth. If I turn up and say, I'll give you a couple of grams, you can't say, oh, that's 100 quid. If I say, give me a quarter, you can't say that's 300 quid. Do you know what I mean? You've got to give it to me because I'll give you the key, innit? I haven't charged you for it. It is what it is. Like, if it's 28 quid, you're getting it for 28 quid. That's what it costs. So there you go. Boom. So because of that, this kid, he's, uh, he said, oh, Marv, can you do it? So I said, yeah, sweet, no problem, no problem, no problem. So I'll give him, I think, two key of gear and 50 key of puff. Right, um, so I don't know how much that might have been about 80 grand, 90, no, 90 grand, 90 grand. Right, so it was maybe 30 quid or 25 quid for the coke and 40 quid for the puff, something like that. So I've given him this gear 47.50 for the puff, 47.50 for the puff, and it was 32 grand a key. So 64 and 32, 90 odd grand, right? So I'll give it to him. What this cheeky cunt's gone and done, right? right? He's supposed to be my mate, right? And he's supposed to be flipping this in a week. So what he's gone and done, he's gone and paid his debt to these gangsters, right? Then took some more work off the gangsters, right? Now he's got to pay me, right? Does he pay me? Does he pay me? No. No, what does he do? He tells, he tells the gangsters, yeah, that I'm coming to rob him. And I've robbed him and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. So the gangsters then, right, calling me, on with me. 
I'm like, what did they want to see me for? And I'll speak to the fella, because there was a bit of issue with the fella anyway. So I've gone and met the fella. He's like, what the fuck? And I'm like, what? He's like, what? So you owe me, you owe me X, mate. You owe me, I want, I was like, wow. I said, mate, let me get, let's have it right. I said, I don't owe no one a fucking penny, mate. And I'm telling you now. I said, to be quite honest with you, you're lucky you're standing here in front of me. I said, because last year I got paid to iron you out. Yeah? And he was like, what the fuck are you talking about? I said, well, what well, it was, they used to get 75 key of coke every month. And the person that got it lined up for them, yeah, said to me, look, rather than we go to them, if we iron him out, we can get the 75 key a week or a month, something like that. So then I didn't know who this fella was. So I've gone to someone, I said, listen, someone's offered me 75 key of Uta to whack this little mug. Who is it? I said, Marv, it's too much today, mate. It's, 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 it's intertwined with family and people we know know their families. It'll be messy. So I'm all right, sweet, not a problem. So I left it. So then a couple of years later, this geezer's in front of me telling me about, right, 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 right. I said, mate, don't get fucking cheeky. You're lucky you're standing in front of me, you cheeky cunt. <laughs> He's like, what? What are you talking about? I said, listen, I could have ironed you out last year over Fernando in your 75 bitch, you mug. And he's like, what? How'd you know about that? What are you talking about? I said, mate, let me tell you. I said, he said, you better tell me who you told you. I said, I ain't fucking telling you nothing. I said, I'll tell you what I will do though, and I promise you, yeah? I'll make them come and tell you. So for his ego, he said, right, you've got a week. So then what I've done, I've set up cameras in my ass, and I've got this fella around, and I've said to him, what happened there? Yeah. So I've said to this fella, obviously this has happened, that's happened, what's happening, what's happening? So now he's spilling the beans. He's spilling all the beans on the video. They're cunts, mate. Yeah, he's a cunt, he's a cunt, and he's one this and this one. You're the only one that's ever helped me, Marv. Because what I'm establishing, what I'm proving to these people now is, I haven't took your work. I've actually given someone 100 grand's worth of grub, and they've pulled my pants down. Now they're using me and you, and they're gonna get us warring. So here's the video. So I've sent them the video of this geezer talking about them, and then that was that, sorted them. Do you know what I mean? But, yeah, it was this never ending ag. Never, and that was just helping someone. Do you know what I'm saying? So everything in that world is just contaminated because no matter how far you get in front, one of your people and one of your friends, one of your friends will pull you back. It can only be the people closest to you that can fuck you. And the only people closest to you that will set you up to get killed or shot or banged up. And that's a fact. So don't think it's a stranger. Look in a circle. It's the closed circles around you that put you in it, mate. I'm telling you. Yeah, it was one. It was my top ecstasy salesperson fell out with Wild Man, and he turned us all. That's, in. What, that's what happens. It always happens. Yeah. It always happens, mate. Yeah. It's only in the circle that get you fucked. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And this when it's when obviously people's noses get put out of joint because they feel less important or they feel more obligated. You know, like they feel a, a sense of entitlement. Like for arguments, I had a one, I had a, I, 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 I branch off quickly. So I've got this young kid now, and I'm back in the Hayda, I'm giving him so much product. I've said to him one day, what the fuck, man? You owe so much money. And he's gone, what are you on about? He said, I'll give you 300 grand last week. And I was like, you ain't give me nothing, you stupid looking cunt. You've paid for product. I said, what do you think? The product's free. I said, do you think it's free? I said, it's been paid for before it even got to this country. And now you've got it because I trust you and you're telling me you're doing me a favour. So here they've got that mad mindset of entitlement because they think they're doing you a favour when you're putting them on. Do you know what I'm saying? But now with hindsight, I see it for what it is. They are doing you the favour because without them, you're not making money. And that's why the grooming process comes in to make people believe that they're going to make a lot more money than they do by making them sell drugs. And that's why now I'm the advocate against the grooming stuff or exposing the grooming for what it is. County lines and all that. All of it. Any, look, any criminal activity is grooming. Mm. right? And they're programmed. Even most of the villains are programmed to groom their youngsters. Mm. They've got to find the next best kid to take the job. Because you go up the ladder and once you've done enough dirt, someone else takes the dirt. And it's about getting the kids in line for that. Why would you do that? Yeah. Why would you do that? Like you can turn over hundreds of thousands of pounds creating sensible, sustainable companies. It's not hard. Do you know what I mean? So that's what I'm promoting now and that's where I'm going now and that's all I thought of drive towards, you know, creating infrastructures to develop businesses and business infrastructures. So we're campaigning for a reversal of drug laws and the war on drugs because drug laws have made plants that were worthless more valuable than gold. Escobar could source a kilo of coca paste for like $60.
when it was going for a kilo of cocaine was going for 60,000 on the streets of America. Because of drug laws, the black market gets bigger every year and there's more incentive and temptation for the youngsters to get into it. What's the answer, Sean? To, to completely reverse and decriminalize and legalize and just have to have um, it regulated and take the crime out of it. Well, do you know who does that at the moment? Who? I'm asking you. The only country that's gone really far with it was was uh, Portugal with the heroin, and they said no, they've done it and cocaine. Yeah, they've done it all drugs. And they it? got the heroin users down to less than fifty thousand. No, it's, it's, it's decriminalised all drugs. You yeah, can't, yeah. You, you cannot get arrested for taking drugs in Portugal. You can't get arrested. It's, it's, it's decriminalised. The users and were no, got, no longer afraid of getting arrested. They spoke to the health teams and they got them off the drugs. Yeah. Well, I, bl I, I blatantly believe that if they legalise drugs, yeah, legalise drugs and put drugs in this way, you could go into a shop and buy them. It, it, all, all, all the bullshit would stop. The courts would empty, the prisons would empty. Uh, but unfortunately, the legal system and all these other parasites are some of the biggest employers in the world. Prison guards unions... They're all lobbying to keep the drug laws tight and keep putting young people in prison for drug in, use. In, 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 in America, they're doing it. But I think over here, we might set a precedent for the Americans to follow. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because I hope so. they, 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 well, they, they started with a puff. Yeah. They started with a puff. So that's people voting for it, not the government. Yeah, but that's what we need to do in this country. Yeah. So me personally, if, for argument's sake, right, if you, if you sold drugs cheaper than the drug dealers... Right, but then you had to go to certain places to buy it. People don't want to be seen buying it, so they wouldn't take it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So the black market would only be for certain types of people, not every person. So the the element that causes the most problem in society are the working class, um, underprivileged. They're the people that cause the problem within communities with the homelessness and all that. But if that's regulated and it's legal and they're getting support doing it, then the middle classes will go to the black market because they don't want to be seen walking into these establishments to get their drugs. So then that's what will be on the black market, the middle class stuff. And that, that's where it's away from the deprived people. It's away from the street. It's away from the, the ethnic minorities killing each other on the street for peanuts. Do you understand? Like, yeah. If the middle class want to take drugs and they want to go black market, then they've got to play extortionate prices because they don't want to walk into this building and see it. Because they've got the money and the resources, they'll pay that money just to keep quiet. It's like the, the pedophilia and the nonsense stuff. They all keep quiet over it. Yeah. Like, that's why there's, there's laws in lobby to say, yeah, that you get more for nicking money than you can for raping a woman. Well, our, a woman our, our, our slogan on this channel is end the war on drugs, start the war on pedos. Because you've got the cops saying, we can't go after these political pedos and all this stuff, Jimmy Salba. We don't have the resources. Yet every time you walk through London, you see him shaking down a kid for weed. Hold on. It's never ending. It's never <laughs> ending. And that's the thing. See, it's just society's just created from a whole heap of nonsense, a whole heap of bollocks, and mm. a whole heap of manipulated psychology. You know, so I'm just trying to find the right way through now and just trying to change the mindsets of anyone from a like-minded environment as myself. Yeah. The pedos and the sex offences, I don't really engage with that because my world don't fraternise, sort of condone or have anything to do with it. So it don't come into our remit, it don't come into our environment, it don't come into our living, it don't come into our space. This is, fortunately, it's like a, a white man's problem, isn't it? You don't get black pedos. Like... Everyone says it, but where's the black pedos? All the, all the nonces in prison. That's are, true. I can't think of any off the top of my head. You, you, look, look at them. All the, all the sex offences. Yeah. How many black nonces have yeah. you seen? Like, there might be a couple of rapists, right? There might be, because I remember a couple of... Bill but, Cosby. Yeah, but, but what I'm saying, you know, there might be a couple of rapists, right? But the, the general consensus of nonces, yeah, are middle-aged white people. Did you see any Nazis get um, handled in prison? Yeah, I served a got, few of them up myself. <laughs> yeah, they got any, done any, with sugar, oil, yeah. like blades, everything. Do you know what I mean? Like you running it like, we just, like they weren't allowed on my wing. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just come on, you want to hurt a little child? I'll show you. I'll show you. Do you know what I mean? I've, I've, I've served a few of them up. Yeah. Served, you couldn't be on my wing if you was a nonce. You couldn't be on my wing if you was a nonce. You weren't allowed. Weren't, weren't allowed. Wasn't allowed, mate. Wasn't allowed. And it wasn't a lad, it just wasn't a lad. And some horrific things happened to them. Do you know what I mean? Like, 
I've, I've heard some stories where people have stuck Q sticks up nonces' asses, but I'm not going to do to a nonce what a nonce does to other people because that makes you a nonce. Do you know what I mean? I'm not going to stick something up your ass. I'm not a fucking nonce. Do you know what I mean? But I'll cut you, I'll put oil on you, I'll beat you, I'll smash your face in. Do you know what I mean? And send you with no teeth. I'll punch nonces' teeth out, all their teeth. Oh, uh, yeah. Because you're allowed belts in prison, so you just put your belt round your hand and punch their teeth out. That's what I was sort of known for, punching people's teeth out. Uh, so is it KOS, kill on sight for nonces in, well, in not, prison? See, it's not kill on sight, but it's just weigh in on sight. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You, you, like, you get like, what? No, it's not acceptable. It is not acceptable. You're not walking past me if I know you're a nonce. It's not happening. It's not happening. It's not happening. It's not happening. Do they put things in the food and stuff like that? Put what things in what food? Like broken glass and things. I heard stories. Yeah, there's loads of stories about yeah. people doing shit like that. But it's just... 98% of people accept them for an easy life in prison. Really? Yeah, they don't. They don't. Because no one wants to lose bird. No one wants to lose their enhanced status. Mm. So he's a nonce, but he ain't a nonce to me. He ain't done me no harm. It's like he's a grass, but he ain't grasped me up. He ain't done me no harm. And that's what everyone does. He ain't done me no harm. He's all right. So if someone says someone's a nonce in UK prison, does the person accusing them have to show the paperwork? They don't know. Over here, it's all bullshit. Everything's he said, she said in this country. I, mean, I know America's totally different. You need evidence. You need to show people. But yeah. over here, it's not. Over here, they can say, you're not like, I've been called a grass. I got shot five times, right? Watch this. I got shot five times. Now, the person that shot me, Mark Ashman, right? he made a statement, 16 pages long, with another guy called Mark Carpell, right? So they both made an agreed statement, 16 pages long, that said, I am a hitman from London that kills people for the London underworld and the British underworld, right? And that I've turned up to shoot this kid over another kid owing money for a watch. I've turned up to kill this kid for the watch. I pulled the gun out, tried to shoot him. He took the gun off me and it's gone off five times accidentally. <sighs> but then, but then, a young whippersnapper, I won't remember, I won't mention his name, but people know who I'm talking about. I call him the whippersnapper because he's only a whippersnapper, right? He come back to this country and tried to tell people I was a grass because it was his father-in-law, retrospectively, well, not retrospectively, he's just, what's, what's the word when it's, it's like, it's not his real father-in-law because he's not married, but his baby mum's mum's boyfriend was the man that shot me. Do you know what I mean? So the whippersnapper, because he wants this kid on board with him in this country, he's come back here and told good people that I know that I'm a grass and I've got them nicked. When they went and handed themselves in, handed themselves in with a 16-page prepared statement saying Marvin Herbert is a hitman from England. He turned up to kill me over a watch and I took, the watch, I took the gun off him and shot him five times accidentally. And then young whippersnapper, yeah, he come back to the country to try to tell everybody that I'm a grass. So when his man that shot me gets out of prison, he gets accepted with open arms. But he's a grass, he's a weak member and he's a coward. And that's just a whippersnapper. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm sure people are curious Marvin they want to ask what does it feel like to get shot five times don't know don't feel nothing don't where, was, feel where nothing. did the bullets go well, one went in my leg right the first one went in my leg and it dropped me and I've tried to get up the second one went through my arm went through the floor off the floor through my pelvis and out my, pel out my spine um Tried to get up again. The third one's gone through my willy. It went down through my willy. Through your willy? Yeah, it went down my willy and ah. shot, shot my right testicle out. Fuck off! Yeah. Oh. Damn. And then the last two, he just, oh, man. he just walked up to me and went bang, bang in the eye. Because look. Fuck me. Oh. Got me straight in the eye. Holy shit. Yeah. And that's my party trick. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Yeah, so... Oh, I, got, I don't know what's worse. The eye or the fucking... I got shot one, one the there. Balls? So if you can see that, Scott, like, there's a hole there. So I got shot there and once in the eye. Because it went through the eyelid. That's why I can't blink. Because it went through my eyelid, so I can't blink now. Yeah. But I'll show you that. I'll send you the x-ray for that. Fuck yeah. me. Yeah, it was close. It, was, it went through my femoral artery in three places. Femoral? And I never bled. That's yeah. a bleeder, isn't it? I never bled, though. How come? I, never bled. I don't know. 
They don't know. The bullet that went through my eye yeah. is flat as a pancake. Like, it's flat as a pancake. Flat as a pancake. But yeah, the bullet that went through my leg shattered my leg into 200 pieces of bone. And the bullet that went through my leg came out the other side of the bone, the, the femur, whole, whole, right? And then um, lodged in my femur archie. Me? Yeah. I got told I'll never walk again. <sighs> so I'm never going to walk again. I'm never going to put 100% weight on that leg. Yeah. And then they, they kicked me out of the hospital. They kicked me out of the hospital because I refused to take morphine. After how many hours, days? Um, four and a half, four and a half weeks it was. Yeah, because it was about four days. I was in there three weeks. Pardon me. <sighs> After three weeks, I'd been a shit. So I said to the nurse, I ain't been a shit. She said, ah, oh, it's not a male, it's their caca, it's their morphina. I was like, what? Fuck, I'm going to be a smackhead. I can't take morphine. So I said, I'm going to stop taking it. So I stopped taking the morphine. And then for four or five days after that, and then they just said, we can't keep you in the hospital. If you're not going to take morphine, we can't keep you in the hospital. I was like, what are you talking about? I said, I want morphine. What do you mean you're not going to keep me in the hospital? They said, well, if you don't take the morphine, you're not taking our instructions and we can't keep you in here under medical instructions. You've got to go. So they kicked me out of the hospital. Two months. So seven weeks I was in the hospital. I was supposed to be in there for a year. Seven weeks, and they boot me out, and I had to get better indoors on on the floor in my home. I can't believe what I'm fucking hearing. Yeah, it happened though. I hope you don't mind me asking, what was the damage to the dick? Nah, nothing, nothing. <sighs> it was all right. It was all right. It was big enough. <laughs> <laughs> big enough to take a bullet. Came back with a vengeance. I was it was, it was, it was, it was mad. It's mad. It went. It went in and went down my penis, and then I, I don't know how, but it just come out of my testicle. Down your fucking penis. Went down my, come running the side of my penis. I got the scars. You can see the scars. Yeah, yeah. Went down my penis and then come out of my testicle. <gasps> but I never actually came, the bullet never actually came out. This is what happened. Did it hurt to piss and stuff for a while? Um. Well, I had a catheter in for the first two months. Yeah. So I never really pissed. But after, <sighs> I had to. I got the catheter out and I had to test it in the hospital. So <sighs> before two months, we got him hard and he came. So I was happy. <laughs> Oh, fucking yeah. hell. So I, I did ejaculate in the hospital. Oh. And uh, that co that come out bloody. It was all blood. I come blood. You Imagine came that. blood? I came blood, yeah. That was, that, was, that, was, that was after that was after three or four weeks in the hospital. I had to, just to see if he works. And he works, so I was happy. He said it came out of the balls, but your ball's intact. Only one ball. It came out of one ball. No, what he done, it, it, went, it went down my penis, and then it went into the, the right testicle. Oh. Because of the pressure, the pressure, the bottom half of my testicle came out of my ball bag. Fuck off. Oh. Imagine that. So when I've gone like that, oh. all I've seen is just a mess in my balls. I was oh. like, what the fuck? But yeah. When I woke up and I wiggled my toes, I was I was just, all I wanted to do was make sure I could walk. I don't give a fuck about the cock, to be quite fair. I just needed to be able to walk. I the walking to to was money. more important than the bunking. Yeah. Without my legs, I can't earn money. That's, how, that's, what, that's what was going on in my head, do you know what I mean? I feel drunk all of a sudden, hearing what you've just described. I'm like speechless. My brain's like, whoa. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. Yeah. So the one that went in your eye, where did that exit, did you say? Give your finger. Ah, oh, Jesus. No, that's what I'm saying, but give that finger. Right, so, yeah. one went... One went in there. Yeah. Filled the hole. Yeah. And then the other one went through there. Fuck me. Into the eyeball. Into the eyeball. Yeah. And then look, when you look in, it oh. stopped halfway through. Halfway through the eyeball, it stopped. It stopped, yeah. Fuck and they don't, lucky it didn't go into the brain. And it flattened. Yeah. Right. They don't know. I'll show you the x-ray. It flattened? Why would it flatten that? They don't, that's what I'm saying. They don't know. That's, hey. like, that's like a miracle, isn't it? That's what I'm saying. They're saying it was like yeah. the hand of God. The hand of God saved me, right? So what I'm going to show you this video, this this now so you can see it yourself so you can understand but it's flat as a pancake and it's got my name up there so you can see it's me because i did concealed weapons permit training and they teach you to go in the eye go behind the ear because the the bullet can just glance off the skull yeah 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 headshots are not a definite that's why they always aim for the chest yeah two in the chest and then two in the, in the head. head yeah yeah 
But they're always all right. That's why um, big... That's what, anyway, I don't want to talk about shootings because I don't want people to think I'm a glorifying it all. But yeah, where is it? Where is it? Fuck me. When, hey, you, when hey. you see these x-rays, you understand what I'm talking about. Can you email those to us and we'll put them in the video so the viewers can, yeah, yeah, can yeah, see well, them? Yeah, right, like, so look, right? So... Right, I got shot through the balls. So, that's the, the, that's so the hopefully catheter. these will be on the screen now yeah, so the viewers will, can see so these while you talk us through catheter. them. And then that was the, the frame I had on my leg for a year. That's the, that's a, I had to leave that open to let all the infection into the bones. Mm. Right, that was the one that went through my arm. And that's the one that went through Holy my forehead. Holy shit, man. And that's the one that went through my eyeball, right? Wow. And then this is the x-rays, look. Look, that's me woken up. That's me waking up. Look, look at a big smile Ooh. on my face. Relentless. I woke up, I wiggled my toes and I was just over the moon I could wiggle my toes. Wow. So now, here's all the x-rays. Right, so that was the break in my leg. Yeah. Right? That was the break. Yeah, so it's completely shattered. Yeah. And then they put this in. Right, so I've got a plate from my hip to my knee with 16 pins in it. Right, see the bullet? See the bullet's hole? It's a whole bullet, right? It's not even bent. Yeah. Right, now watch the bullet that went through my eye. Pancaked. Halfway through my eye. <sighs> and that's the x-ray. Wow. And they don't know what. And at the top of the thing, look, Marvin Herbert, 24th of the 4th. 24th of the 8th. 1990-2008 and they don't know what stopped it going halfway through the eye are so, you religious or anything did it no, make you ponder the meaning of life I've always been a spiritual guy I've always yeah. been protected I've always had this energy stream that I know I can only do things at a certain time like I'll do things with a certain feeling people yeah. that know me always just say I was off my nut but yeah. it's just I'm just my mum's a spiritual I've been spiritually protected since a kid yeah you know, so I've never been religious because religion don't make sense to me mm -hmm. it's too hypocritical yeah. You know, and religion is the biggest segregator of all men. Like when we're not, not any every religion says you mustn't segregate, but yet every religion's called a different religion. Why? Yeah, it should just be the uh, the, the the words in it or the, the the way. It shouldn't be Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, Christian, Catholic, Jewish. It shouldn't be that. Do you know what I mean, it should just be we are one species. People just forming cliques throughout history, whether it's the Bananos, the Republicans, the Democrats, Bananos, Gambinos, Muslims, Christians. It just seems human nature. It's, it's prison, not, it's, all no, the little gangs not. in prison. But what is it? It's a, it's a way of control. Yeah, and it's a way of it's control. It's a way of control. Pyramid structure. It's just a control yeah, yeah. for the weak-minded people to, well, the strong-minded people to manipulate the strong physical people. Yeah. yeah right? Yeah. So it's just a way that they've, evolved in life through oh wait, man, I'm a bit of a weird one because I believe in <laughs> extraterrestrial activities and I, I believe the there's earth so much flat. out there how can, we, how can we rule it out there's so much out there we, we just a, I, we know know the earth really. I know the earth's flat I know we're in a parallel universe I know we are not the only people on this planet I know we get visited from other species from other planets I know yeah that they haven't been to the moon. Like, there's, 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 I'm not one of them conspiracy theorists, it's just logic. There's, there's a lot of logic. I mean, it's like, I'm gonna do this to you right now, right? Watch this. Because, David Icke is a regular guest of ours, and he yeah, talks yeah, to this. Right, listen, this, this, this is so simple, right? That I'll do it, to, I'll show it to everyone, right? And when people see this, they just think, wow, that's true. And this is so fucking simple. I don't understand how people don't get it, right? Watch this, right? Right, so. Pictures of the globe from space. Right. These pictures should match. Yeah, they do. That's all we need. <laughs> right. Yep. What's that? Earth. What's that? Right, so you believe it's round, don't you? Because of that picture. It's a bit egg-shaped, isn't no, it? No, 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 watch, 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 hold the phone. Right, right. Now, I want you to answer these questions honestly, right? What is that white stuff in the circle? Clouds. Okay, so they're clouds. They're clouds. They're clouds. So, 
Do you land on them clouds or do you fly through them clouds? Through. Okay. So you see that circle that you can see there? See the circle you can see? But the circle you can fucking see, you've got to penetrate that circle to fly through them clouds, to land on the ground. So that fucking circle does not exist. It doesn't exist. It is a reflection of our atmosphere. Here's another question for you. Look at that picture. Oh, it's gone. Right, look at this picture, right? Watch. So here's another one, right? It's a reflection of our atmosphere, right? Because you've got, you got to penetrate that circle and then you've got to fly 62 miles to the land. 62 miles. Yeah, it's only 7.6 miles to the bottom of the ocean. So we're not round. Right, now the deepest part of the ocean is 7.6 miles down to the bottom of the ocean, the deepest part of the ocean, right? The circle doesn't exist because you have to penetrate that to land through the clouds, right? So if that circle don't exist, what is it? And here's another question for you. Is it nighttime or daytime in space? It's a fucking simple question, Sean. You're an intelligent man. Is it nighttime or daytime in space? Depends which side of the earth you're on. No, it doesn't. If you're in space, if you're in fucking space above the planet, is it daytime or nighttime? There isn't any. It's fucking daytime because the only thing that makes. Oh, it's always the sun. <laughs> always the sun. Because the sun is yeah, always yeah. there. Unless you... you're behind the planet. No, but, right, no, you're not listening. Right? <laughs> I never said behind the planet. I said if you're in space, <laughs> if you're in space, if you are in space, right? Yeah. Is it nighttime or daytime? Now, if you're behind a the planet, then it's going to be nighttime. If you're in space above a planet, it's fucking 24 hour daytime. Yep. Why? Right? Because time doesn't exist. Time does not exist in space. Time does not exist in space. Why? Because you've got no night or daytime. Time only exists on a planet. Yeah. Why? Because it rotates. It rotates. So time doesn't exist. Time is something that's created by man on this earth. It's like the days when it took God seven days to create the planet, correct? According to the Bible, was that? Right. We're still in the seventh day. The seventh day is not over. So when did the seventh day start? And when is it over? And that shows you the definition of time. Right, so we're attributing that day to 24 hours. So God never created the earth in seven 24 hours, did he? He created it in seven days from... 4,000 years ago, when they described time, where before they had clocks. So what was a day? A day was a period, a period. A day was a period. There was no length to a period. It's just when it happened. From that period to this period, from that period to the next period. And then people put time in the equation. And then because we changed the perception of time into 24 hours, it's only 24 hours. So time only exists on this planet because we rotate, right? But what, does, what is time in space? There is none. That's why light speed. That's why it takes so long to go up into space and back down. Like people just don't get it. So I believe that that's a bird's eye view of our planet, a bird's eye view of our planet, and underneath that is flat. So you've only got a dome. We're only domed. We are a dome, we're not a sphere. Where we're done, but they're showing you us down. Because when you look at the planet, you can see the whole continents. You can see all the continents when you look down. Yeah. Well, right? how? If we're round, how can you see all the continents when you look down? We're round, bruv. I think David Ike says we're just looking at it through our sensory apparatus, which it. isn't really what it's is not, there. It's not there though, because yeah. you, right, watch. When you look at something, your brain's already. Um, move the image anyway yeah because we see upside down we see upside down and our iris flips it back to be normal so what we're seeing ain't what you're really seeing that's why they say never believe anything you see yeah do you know what i mean it's not real because everything we see is only a reflection of the the light rays and our perception through our vision do you know what i mean so we all see everything differently we all see every everything's different in colors different shades affect different people Different lights affect different people. It's all nonsense. So I'm one of them humans that believe we're human beings that have been manipulated into believing that this reality we live in is life, but it's not. And that's why I subscribe to Tolstoy's quote, the highest 
flight of wisdom is to admit that we know nothing because all we're getting fed is bullshit we know nothing powers yeah what yeah. i believe in is this being the best human being you can be right is just being the fittest strongest healthiest human being you can be so stay away from fat dairy sugar red meat chicken eat and sweets eat mixed nuts nuts <laughs> nuts berries how how did you recover green tea how did you recover then over the months what was your recovery process like from the five shots? And did it make you think, right, I need to rethink my occupation? Yeah, no, it wasn't an occupation, no at all, no. Um, what happened was I had to work out how to get bone back on bone. I had to get calcium into my bone. So I started researching food and what's the best f food source to get calcium into my bone? Because they're telling me I'm never gonna walk in. So I need to eat as much calcium as possible. And I found out nothing you eat, drink or take intravenously gives you calcium. Nothing. So how'd you get it then? Broken bone. Broken bone? Yeah, that's how it recalcifies. Right. Yeah. So the reason why I'm walking today, yeah. and I've got thousands of witnesses in Spain, and they will tell you, and people will come on when I have my podcast, and they'll tell you that I physically broke my own leg for 18 months. Every day, every week, every month, just continuously break. You can hear it breaking every time I moved. <laughs> when I was in the hospital, they wanted me to lay in bed for a year and take, put no weight on my legs, stay down. And I was like, what? For what? Oh, you must lay down. You, mu you mustn't disrupt it. You've got to sit. And I was like, no, 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 no. So I got up and I went out collecting money, doing deals, doing what I was doing in a mess, in a mess, sweating, screaming every day every time i moved it was just painful beyond belief like you can't even describe the pain i went through but it was just like every time i moved i broke my leg 25 times do you know what i mean so just imagine just someone smashing your leg with a hammer every time you moved Jesus. that's what it felt like yeah like you see that the fact the fragments right when you see the fact you see it anyway you've just seen them when every time i moved then fragments just dislocated they're detached from each other so it's constant and then it got stronger and stronger and stronger to the point where I got in the swimming pool because I had a swimming pool outside the, the house I had rubber rings around my belly and rubber rings around my arms and I just started walking in the swimming pool and then I started walking with two crutches and then one crutch and I started in the boxing ring with one crutch and then took the crutch away and then just just got myself better eating all the proper food all the proper diet all the proper vitamins, all the natural products. I'd, I'd done no painkillers. All I'd done was, um, I did take THC drops, CBD drops and things like that. Do you know what I mean? A lot of THC I took, um, which is the basis for cannabis. Um, I took a lot of THC, a lot of CBD, and I did smoke a hell of a lot of weed to get better, you know? But that helped me with the sleep and the pain. Right, and then obviously the eating, because when you're in so much pain, it's hard to eat. Mm. Like people don't get it. Like you don't eat when you're in real bad pain, right? So for me to eat, it was always best me be quoted up. So I was just I was constantly stoned for the first two years, and just stone breaking my leg, stone breaking my leg, stone breaking, and eating the most nutritional food I could eat for a human being, which is alkaline. So I just ate a, a raw alkaline diet, drank nothing but green tea and lemons. Do you know what I mean? Lemons and bicarbonated soda. You know, like, a just real healthy diet for my human body. As much greens as possible, you know? And that was it. And then I just stayed healthy, stayed in the gym, stayed focused, stayed positive. Do you know what I mean? Stayed healthy. What's your pain like now? Um, it comes and goes, but I'm just... I. It's gonna sound weird, but I don't feel pain. See, I don't feel pain because of what I've been through as a kid. I, my brain can switch off, and that's why I just got a bit emotional. Then I don't want to start getting all teary then. But any time I think of pain, I just see. I just think of my dad. Yeah, I hear you. So any time I think of pain, I think of my dad because. That's the diversion, do you know what I mean? So when I'm in pain, my dad comes in my head and I don't feel pain no more. So when I'm thinking about pain, it makes me emotional now because I've got to think of my dad and I did love my dad. I really did love my dad. And 
I miss him now, he's dead, and I never had the opportunity to make a relationship with him because I listened to a lot of inharmonious information about him from my mum, and I sort of took sides with my mum and never believed my dad. Although my dad wasn't an angel, my mum wasn't an angel either, and no one deserves to be alienated from their kids, you know? Like, I've got kids, and they kill me. Kill me, my kids. Sometimes my eldest kids don't want to talk to me, and it fucking hurts. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It really does hurt. Like, when you ring them for, like, a month, and they don't pick their phone up, and then all of a sudden they'll ring up and say, oh, hi, Dad, sorry I missed all your calls. And you just think, wow, like, I'm sorry I hurt you so much. I'm sorry I wasn't there, but let's make it up because you're going to regret it, but they just don't get it. You know, like I was a fool for the mistakes I made as a kid. I owe it to my children to make it up to them. I can never replace the days I was never there, but if we don't build a relationship, how are they going to ever get any sort of closure when they're older? Like, I haven't got closure now. When I think about my dad, I get emotional. And I know my kids ain't been through half of what I've been through and I know when I die, they're going to hate themselves because I hate myself for not listening to my dad or trying to build a relationship with my dad because I believe my mum. And I know my older kids believe their mum, you know, and it's just sad. But it's life, it's working class environments, making the wrong choices, becoming a gangster, thinking I'm the best thing since sliced bread. And these are my consequences. So the pain I live with and the suffering I go through is self-inflicted. So I don't want no pity from nobody because I should have been a better dad. I shouldn't have been in prison. I shouldn't have been in prison. I should have thought I'm going to fucking shovel shit for my kids. I ain't going to prison, do you know what I mean? But because of the ego, the mindset and the environment, the programming, it's a combination of everything. But ultimately, I made choices and they were the wrong ones and I've got to be accountable for that. And I am, hence the reason why it makes me so emotional. <sighs> because no kid deserves to suffer. No kid deserves not to have their parents there. Do you know what I mean? Like, no kid deserves not to be loved. And my kids felt I didn't love them. And although I loved them undoubtedly, unquestionably the way I showed them my love was just to make sure that they never went without the materialistic stuff that I yearned for when I was a kid but by, <laughs> by giving them what I never had created what I went through do you know what I mean and that's the madness that I wish I could change but I can't and I've got to live with it and maybe one day they'll see and have a little bit of empathy but they're like me, they're hard-headed, they're stubborn, and they won't bend. So it ain't until I'm gone that they're gonna realize their mistake, and it's sad, and it pains me, but it's reality, it's life, and there's just nothing we can do about it. Only they can change how they think and feel, and only they, they can change what they do. So I can only hope and pray that one day, before I die, the penny drops with them, and uh, we build a phenomenal relationship again, you know? Perhaps the penny's going to drop from them watching these podcasts. Have any of them mentioned to you? They won't watch them. They won't watch them. No, uh, they, they, they just, I don't think, I don't know. Like, I know all their friends watch them. And their friends, all their friends are blown away by my story. And I, I communicate with my kids' friends more than I do my own kids. You know what I mean? Like, my kids, even, like my, my kids' friends say, I can't believe you. they won't listen to you. Like, why don't they have nothing to do with you? Like, and they all benefit, like their friends all benefit from me, but I think it's the stubbornness again, because if they side with me, they're letting their mum down. Mm. And I, that, I went through all the same thing with my mum. I didn't want to let my mum down. Do you know what I mean? So I understand where they're at, and I love them for being so loyal to their mum, but they don't realise the pain they're suffering that they're going to have when they're older. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm not that guy their mum said I am. <laughs> Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I'm not that guy their mum said I am. Like, I'm not that guy. Like, I wasn't there. You're right. I wasn't there. And your your mum's right. I wasn't there. But what your mum's saying, I was, I wasn't that guy. I wasn't there because I thought me being in prison and giving you that money every week, that house to live in, them clothes to wear, the presents. I never got Christmas presents every year. I never got birthday presents every year. I never got pocket money. So making sure my kids had all that 
I thought I was doing the right thing. Perhaps the message is reaching them through their th friends, and that is a good first step to get through to them. Mate, whatever way it takes some through, time. Whatever, yeah, listen, time is what we all have, and time is something that I don't really play with anymore because everything has its own time, and I don't rely on my time for anything to happen. So everything has its destined time. So in time, it will get better, I hope. You know, but it's still painful. It's still painful. So, <sighs> and this is a real bad man. And this is the fucked up shit that us real bad men have to go through. Why? So we can be that bad man. Do you know what I mean? And this is the thing that I don't mind showing, you know, because I was a bad man. For what? To impress everybody, to get my back, my ego massaged. My kids are suffering and I'm suffering now. Do you know what I mean? So it ain't worth it. Fuck it. None of it's worth it. Get a job. Look after your family and be the best man you can be. Be the healthiest man you can be. Be the strongest, fittest man you can be and provide your family with everything they need. Materialistically, financially, spiritually, but more importantly, personally. That personal presence in your kid's life is everything. At the end of the day, your fair weather friends are going to depart when the shit hits the fan and it's your family that has your back. I lost all my money, the cops seized it. My parents, they're not rich people. They remortgaged the house, come up with almost a hundred grand to get me out of that situation. Mm. Otherwise I'd still be in prison right now because in America you get what justice you can afford. So think about your family members when you're doing these things. I know that the, the, the drugs road is very long and you just think you're fun and it's cool at the beginning. If you're going down that road, you're getting closer to just breaking your mom and dad's hearts. You know, your kids, are they going to come and visit you in prison? And all the shit they're going to go through because of your criminal association. Um, it's a huge, important lesson is think about your family. You can make all the money in the world. What is it worth? It's not worth shit. Who's going to be there on your deathbed? It's going to be your family members, isn't it? That is way more important. And I've been on my deathbed. And it's only, it's only your scope, like, the amount, that's what made me go straight because that's, that's what broke my heart more than anything. The fact that all the people I'd sacrificed my future, my life, and my well-being for never come to see me. And the only people that come to see me, the people that I made suffer. They made, like, do you know what I mean? I made suffer, you know? Like your friends, your family, like your, your close, close friends and your family, you make suffer. You know, because even my closest friends, they was like, don't, why are you wishing your liberty? Don't do that, Marv, man. Like my closest friend growing up, Timothy Kenevy, he turned his life around after our first armed robbery. Well, after our first nicking. When we got nicked for armed robbery, we was on the landings with all the cat A's, 18, no, 19, 20 years of age we was. And he said then, Mark, I ain't doing this no more. They're mugs, look at them all. Look at them. They're 40 years of age. They're mugs, mate. I ain't gonna be here at 40. You're fucking, I ain't never coming back. And he's never been back. He's never been back, he got out. Like, he had his own issues, transcending to where he is today, but he's a phenomenal human being. He's got over his issues, he brought up his children, his children are phenomenal, and they're basically middle class, his kids, you know what I'm saying? So gone, gone to university, you know, like, that's a testament in itself that your children to go to university, we don't even push for that in a working class environment. Do you know what I mean? Like, what the fuck is that all about? Get to university, become somebody. University, you will become somebody. You will have something to apply to life. Will benefit, you know, some benefits. Like, you ain't, you ain't gonna really benefit getting a, a, a job and working for the rest of your life. You're just gonna get the same as everybody else and be miserable and moan that you gotta pay taxes. Create infrastructures to create employment. That is the key create employment for others and you will become wealthy, okay? So don't be, be selfless, create employment for others so you can become wealthy. And my wealth I'm gonna create is for my kids, 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 kids and their kids to survive when I'm well after I'm gone, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's my legacy I'm looking to leave. It's not about me being financially Keiko and spoiling and partying. I partied hard my whole entire life from when I was 14 years of age. 13, 13 years of age, we partied hard, you know? So I, I've got no more partying in me, you know? I don't even drink now. I occasionally, like I had a drink at my mate's wedding 
had a drink at my mate's christening. I had a drink at my mate's um, funeral. I drunk one, like, I'd say in the last six years, I've literally had six drinks. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I've stopped as well. Uh, come on, man. It's, it's, it's a catalyst to badness. It's a catalyst It's a catalyst to drink, to drugs and violence. And that's it. Drugs, violence and prison. Drink is the number one drug in the deaths of young people. Binge drinking and the violence and the murder. Number one drug in all violent crime and number one drug in all sex crime. Listen, yeah. more people die from alcohol and dairy than anything else on this planet. Dairy products and alcohol are the two biggest contributing killing factors of this planet. Fact. Yet the weed is the devil in the eyes of the government. No, it has to take the dairy off the dairy and the alcohol. Because that's the government's baby. That's the government's like drug. Do you know what I mean? That's the that government's hook. Dairy and alcohol. They've legalised it. But that's killing everybody. And tobacco was the big one as well, wasn't it? Yeah, but see, it's only what the chemicals they put in tobacco. You see, the conspiracy theories again. Tobacco isn't actually harmful if you, unless you put all the chemicals in it. Got to make that money. Got to make that money. All right, so you described brilliantly how you recovered and rebuilt from the injuries. How did you rebuild your life once you were back, you know? Walking away from crime. You walked away. What year was that? 2015. That was 2015. Not yeah. that long ago. Not that long ago. And that was... I was still heavily involved in sort of uh, collecting, protecting, and sort of uh, providing everything still. Apart from guns, but drugs, violence, and protection, I was de um, developing and providing. Um, and then we got to a situation where a young kid owed a bit of money and he had to get hurt and I found out it was my son's friend. Jeez. And that was the penultimate turning point of my life. And that's when I realised, that's when I realised that I was causing 98% of the problems in my environment. You know, when the people were getting stabbed and shot and beaten and robbed, that's because I'm getting products put in their hand. Do you know what I mean? And they're getting robbed for the money, they're getting robbed for the product, people hating. So I just thought, I can't do this no more. So I, I sat him down, I said, look, I'll wipe your debt clear if you come off the road. He come off the road and he's gone on to become an exemplary human being. He turns over a phenomenal amount of money with his little organisation and uh, they're spitting the, the artists, the music artists at one every year and they're making good progress. So they've got the biggest artist on the scene at the moment. Do you know what I mean? They've got four coming up behind him. You know, so can you, can you give him a plug, or you do not want to mention? Um, but the artist is Young Ambush, and uh, yeah, Young Ambush. He was my son's friend. Um, G Man was the young guy I mentored, um, and their organisation is just growing, and it's Buzzworld. And check them out; they're phenomenal human beings. I think together we're going to change the face of this grime street music, and to to create positive content for people to grow with, learn with, and adapt to, you know? Do they have a YouTube channel? We could put that below the video. Yeah, it should be, it should be. Um, Buzzworld should be out right there, everything, yeah. Okay. Buzzworld. And I'd, I'd like to take a little bit of credit for what they've become, because I don't know where they would be if it wasn't for my transition into the legitimate world. I believe Young Gotten, I mentored, still mentored today, mentored him into the man he is. He's, he's, on YouTube he's given me the acclaim that I've mentored him through his fatherhood how to become a better father how to live train like everything I do I give him information so he can grow as an individual I don't charge him or cost him I don't I don't build no one for now I just do what I do because I love them man they're my kids friends and they're the younger generation it's, it's our responsibility to perpetuate the species productively and positively without harming or devastation. And the only way to do that is by mentoring kids in the right way, not giving them products that can put them in prison or get them stabbed, shot or killed. Exactly. You know? And you touched on another important thing in my own soul searching in reflecting on what I've done, is you, there comes a point where you have to take responsibility for everything you've done. I think when you first get arrested, you're like, ah, oh, fucking cops have got me and they're being sneaky and you're like, you're resisting it. But there comes a point where you have to take responsibility for everything and even the people who cooperated with the police against you you have to take responsibility for employing those people 
and, and choosing those people and having them work with you. And since I got released, I have been in communication with those people and I told them I completely forgive them. I, I, you know, hired you. It was They've my, done it nothing was my wrong. decision. Yeah, exactly. They've done nothing yeah, wrong. It's like yeah. the guy that shot me. I want him, I want him to develop programs with me on forgiveness <clears throat> and retribution because without him shooting me, I'd still be a lunatic. <laughs> And I dread, I actually dread to think where I'd be right now if I never got shot. So I actually thank Mark for being brave enough, brave enough to shoot me because I was doing madness on this planet for years and no one was brave enough to shoot me. Do you know what I mean? Because of the consequences from the networks that I was connected to, no one, everyone was always, it wasn't personally just me, but no one knew who was gonna come for them because I'm connected to this one, that one, this one, that one, this one. So who's gonna come for me? And everyone loves Marv. Do you know what I mean? Some people hate Marv because I'll get things done better than them and they resent me, envy, all that bollocks. They're the ones that hate me, but generally people love me because I'm selfless. I do for you so you can benefit. Do you know what I mean? Even when I was giving people drugs, it weren't so I could benefit. Well, the only way I benefited is because that was my bank. So if I've got 60 grand, I'll buy two kilos, I'll give you a kilo, I'll give you a kilo. Right. So to me, I'm only getting my money back off of you, but in hindsight, yeah, it's my free drugs. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And any time I needed money, it was there. Yeah. So that was just my banking structure. So for that sake, people believed I was something special. Yeah. Because I'd give you 50 key, 100 key, 200 key a puff. Mm -hmm. I'll give you three, four, five key a coke. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'll do that because that's my money in the bank. Do you know what I mean? When I've got no graft, you know, I've got no money. <laughs> <laughs> and that was how it was growing up as a kid, you know. So I just advise everybody just to get out of that world. It's not healthy. It's not good. I smile and I laugh. But I cry also. And you see me cry and that's real pain. It's not, it's not made up, you know. Like, I've suffered. And everybody in that world suffers. Even people in the shovel now are suffering. They're bad men that are never getting out of jail. And yeah, they're bad men. Yeah, but they're never getting out of jail. Their kids, their cousins, their mum, their dad have got to go and visit them until they bury them. Why? For what? So people can pat them on their back and say that they're the guy. Come on, man. We've all got to wake up and stop this madness. Stop this madness. And we've all got to build and grow and perpetuate our species into a better place for the future, for our great grandkids. So that's my journey now on, you know what I mean? Yeah, I could speak to you for hours, Marvin. Um, I can't believe what you've been through. I've learned a lot more about you today. I feel really close to you, I actually, mean, after you've told me these things. A lot of respect. I, I, nearly, I nearly died there when I got stabbed there. I nearly died there when I got stabbed in my heart. I nearly died in my lungs. I've had both my lungs punctured. Do you know what I mean? I've had my femoral artery busted three times. Do you know what I mean? I've been, I've had an under mile an hour bike crash on a motorbike, a head on collision. Do you know what I mean? I've been chopped in the head twice with an ax. I've been stabbed, I don't know how many times. Like, do you know what I mean? We've been through it. We've yeah. been through it, yeah. mate. Like, I've got the scars to prove it, and I've got defense wounds where I've been stabbed in the arm, like people stabbing me in the arm, and I'm fucking, I've been shot. Not just on that occasion, I got shot with another little shotgun a little pepper thing. I've been shot with a tutu. Do you know what I mean? I've been cut, stabbed, beaten. Like, I've had fights. I've been incarcerated. Like, it's, it, 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 it's no life. Do you know what I mean? Like, I've got through all that stuff because I put myself through that. I'm accountable to say I made the wrong choices and what I've been through has not been worth it. Now, I'm 48 years of age and I've got fuck all. My mate's 48 years of age. He's worth hundreds of millions. He ain't a bad man. He ain't stabbed no one. He ain't cut no one. He ain't shot no one. He's never even been in prison. Do you know what I mean? So that's what I want to promote. That kind of lifestyle. That kind of living. Not my living. Not my lifestyle. That was a load of shit what I've lived. Do you know what I mean? Like, don't get me wrong. I'm glad I got through it. And I'm here to say I got through it. But it's been shit. It's been shit. And it hasn't been worth it. Because it's been shit. Yeah? You have sporadic moments in life where, oh yeah, it's wicked. And then it's shit for years and then it's good again for a little bit and then it's shit for months and then it's good and then it's shit again and then you're in prison it's shit, it's shit, 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 shit and then your bird's shit your fucking friends are shit your life's shit and then you move on and then you get another bird and then that's shit and it's just all bullshit everything's shit 
100% shit, bullshit with a capital shit. Simple. Last question then. What was your lowest moment in prison? Uh, uh, being honest, I never had a low moment in prison. You didn't get suicidal or anything like that? No. I, I'll tell a lie. Once. Never got suicidal, but Something happened between me and my ex-missus and my eldest son refused to... I was in Parkhurst and I was about nine, about 21. So I'm in Parkhurst with all the double cat A's and all the proper gangsters, all the old faces and, and, and my son didn't want to speak to me. He didn't want to speak to me. No, it just broke my heart. And it... And then basically... I took myself off the wing and I went down the block and I started taking antidepressants. I'd see the doctor, I said, I'm depressed, I'm sad, I'm, I feel suicidal, I don't want to live, my son don't love me, my son don't love to do me, I don't know what I'm going to come out to. And then I was basically, I was down the block in Parkhurst and I heard someone out the window shouting to the screws, you think I'm a fucking mouse? I ain't no mouse. I'm a fucking man. Fucking mouse. You think I'm a mouse? Fucking man. I ain't no fucking mouse. And I'm lying in my bed. I thought, wow, what am I? A man or a mouse? I thought, I can't fucking take fucking antidepressants. I've got on the buzzer, called the doctor, Dan. I said, I need to speak to the doctor. The doctor's going, I don't want your pills, mate. Take them back. I'm like, what you want? I said, I don't fucking want them. And then I went back on the wing. But then replacing that trauma with violence. So that was the lowest point of my prison. But yeah. apart from that, I just candy coated it with trauma. So my trauma was getting parcels, um, getting gear, selling gear, and just creating more avenues to deflect the low points, I'd imagine, which never made me feel low because I was always high. Do you know what I mean? So replacing the trauma with trauma, never dealt with the trauma, so I don't know what trauma I ever dealt with or had, but I do know the lowest point was that in Parkhurst in 1994, when I didn't think my son loved me or didn't really want to see me again. And that, 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 that was my lowest point in prison. But apart from that time, I never had a low time because I was always out my nut or drink or just burying all my problems with alcohol and drugs. I appreciate your honesty, Marvin, and the people watching this, if you're as blown away as I am right now, every from, from a fucking bullet going down your dick and through your bloody testicle to a bullet stopping in your eyeball, I mean, I'm still like hot and flustered just thinking about all the fucking shit you've just said, and it's like... This has got to be one of the craziest, wildest stories and interviews we've ever done on this channel. But it's also got this important social message. And I urge people to go down into the description box, click on Marvin's channel, click on Christian's channel. They're doing these podcasts. Perhaps by the time this is up, the interview they've done with me will be on it. It's really good viewing. Marvin put my story to the stress test. I had that come in and I feel a real special bond with him you're, now. You're, 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 I'm glad about it, yeah? <laughs> and the, the, the reason why I'm glad we'd done that it was because it was like it was like the kangaroo court that we used to hold in prisons. <laughs> so you had to... Like, New arrivals. Yeah, that, that's it. Like, yeah, yeah, I, I've, yeah. Seen, I've seen your podcast. I've seen your things. I've, I've seen your way you do things. Your eyes are always darting all over the place. You're always a bit shady, but... You've, you've explained because of where you come from, you're not a bad man, you're not a gangster. Do you know what I mean? You're a, a middle class urban fucking white person from a small town in outside Liverpool. Do you know what I mean? You're not accustomed to what we're accustomed to. So, me looking at you, I'm expecting to see another version of me, right? But you're not that guy. No, I had anxiety. Yeah, I know that's from, what from, I'm from, uh, so, I did the drugs because of my anxiety. So, and then I watched too many gangster movies and got gangster writers. Yeah, and that's why having that cross-examination through the podcast yeah. was good because then people were going to see the honesty in the cross-examination. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because I didn't expect you to respond as well as you did. Right. I expected you to fall apart and start <laughs> saying, I don't want to, I want to go, I want to go. <laughs> do you understand? Like, I didn't expect that. I, 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 was, I was gunning for it, but I thought, do you know what? 
I don't think he's going to answer. I don't think he's going to do this. I don't think he's going to do that. But you answered all the questions and you give me all the information I needed. And even going off camera because of the legalities in certain situations yeah. you're in, I appreciate that because it is what it is. And I understand where you're going. I understand what you're doing. And I understand when there's a legal aspect of a scenario, then we have to abide by the law. And will you... Um are you up to coming on and being interviewed by me and Wildman then? Yeah. That'll yeah, be once, fun. Once, once, in the new year, we'll do that. Yeah. So that, what is it? I've, I'm getting myself out there in the social media aspects platform, making myself exist, and maybe I'll have you and Wildman come on mine. I, I, I just want to see you and Wildman shoot the shit. Yeah. Because you've, Two of the two of the fucking craziest bastards I've ever met in my life. Yeah. Well, lovable. Totally lovable, guys. With fucking hearts of mountain lions. Yeah. Uh, you got a lot in common with him. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So if you're watching this, like I was just saying, please go down in the description box, Marvin's channel. Please subscribe. Please watch the videos and support the work that he's doing. Like he said, he hasn't got anything, but he's trying to get people to go on this positive track and he's, he's trying to rebuild, uh, rebuild a legitimate business as well. I'm grooming for the right reasons. So I'm grooming, I want to groom billionaires. I want to groom people into becoming the best versions of them they can be and the best human beings they can ever become. And if I'm wrong for that, then so be it. But I'd rather do that than grooming a kid to go to prison, get shot or get killed. We might want to, in this day and age, we might want to change that word to mentoring, um, Marvin. Grooming's got a bad Yeah, but you know what is this? See, I'm, it's... It's the, it's the same principle. It is, but it's got a bad connotation yeah, because of grooming gangs and shit. Yeah, I, know, I know, but what it is is the, the same thing, right? You can't hide away from the reality. Yeah. Right? So I'm what I'm saying to you is this. You got... What I'm doing is mentoring or you've got grooming. Do you know what I mean? So for the kids to understand where I come from, I'm grooming you to be a billionaire. Do you know what I'm saying? Let me groom you to be a billionaire. I'm not, I'm not going to give you a product that's going to get you put in prison or get you shot killed. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So they don't understand mentoring. Do you know what okay, I mean? Like, okay. So it's just my little, it's, it's my little unique selling point. You know? like, there's not many people that can get away with saying that word, mate. You know what I'm saying, John? And there ain't many people that will get support from the criminal network because the criminal network are a bunch of groomers. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And yeah, that, that's what yeah, they do. They yeah, groom yeah. other people so they can all benefit. Do you know what I mean? And prosper. And then the ones at the top of the chain, the ones at the top of the chain, try to change things. Do you know what I mean? And then the people in the middle of the chain don't want to change things. They're caught in the middle. I fucking love Marvin. He keeps it so real. I mean, if you love Marvin as well, go down, click on the link, support him, subscribe, go on his socials, and, and comment on his podcast, comment on this podcast, go in our description box, support our socials, Support our cameraman, sound engineer. There's donation links down. There's the social media links. There's all of the playlists. We really appreciate your love and support. This has been such a fucking interesting day for me. Um, it's going to go down with one of my all-time favorite interviews, no doubt. And I hope we can do a lot more work with Marvin. I'm going to give him a big hug now. Let's get the microphone out of the way. Yeah, cheers, brother. Really appreciate that. That was fucking brilliant. Yeah, it was. It was good. Thank you.